Hi everybody, Professor Cruz here, and welcome back to our week one lecture on world religions and global issues. This is the part two lecture where we're going to continue delving into um, these different themes that we've been talking about so far. So in the piece we read from uh, Schleiser, Kadefsi, Orlana, and Kontai, they ask this question about, did religion do it? So when we think about uh, religion and violence, is it really religion's fault um, for all the violence we're seeing in the world, as some scholars suggest, or is there more to that story? So they argue, in line with what we saw from Jürgen Zemeyer earlier, that when we look at human history, both you know now and in the past, uh, religion and violence appear to be best friends. And as they note, according to a recent report from the Pew Research Center, more than one quarter of the world's countries experience high or very high levels of social hostility involving religion, compared to one-fifth um, just in 2007. So a significant change in a little over 15 years, a little bit more than 15, not quite 20 years. Um, but they also note that we need to be cautious when we talk about religious violence uh, for at least two key reasons. And the first one is that it can make us see religion as the primary or sole cause of violence, um, when in fact there may actually be more deeper underlying issues and religion just kind of a surface cover um, for that violence. And the secondarily, or sort of the second reason, is that um, it can paint religious violence as irrational and fanatical, but make sort of secular violence appear rational and sort of acceptable. So religious violence bad, uh, sort of normal secular violence okay. Um, and they argue that there's a danger in doing that because it sort of normalizes the violence in a certain way. And as we've seen, you know, religion is really ambivalent. It can promote violence or it can promote peace. And so it makes more sense to talk about the sort of uh, violence with religious dimensions rather than strictly religious violence. And there's at least three ways our authors suggest that we can think about um, kind of how um, violence with religious dimensions plays out. So one is the nature and role of religion in society. So we really need to think about um, different time periods and the context of different events to see, well, how was religion influencing conflicts going on at that time, and was it sort of a, a factor influencing or shaping violence, or perhaps mediating violence? A second way is thinking about the relevance of different dimensions of religion in a specific context. So was uh, the point of contention about which religious tradition you follow, or was it about a different interpretation of a religious doctrine, or was it something else, a specific religious site, perhaps, um, that was the reason for a conflict? And then the third example they talk about is thinking about um, the individual understanding of religion by scholars. Because really when we think about, um, you know, we read about religious violence, we're always hearing about that through the lens of a reporter or a journalist or a writer or a scholar who has their own kind of understanding of what religion and violence are. And so we're also always being influenced by that as well. So being able to keep sort of these three dynamics in mind can help us think about um, complicating the idea of religious violence and think about violence with religious dimensions. Now, when we talk about religion and violence, there are kind of three different types of interconnected violence that scholars like Johann Galtung have identified that can help us think about um, this kind of interplay of religion and violence, in particular identifying the root cause of violence. So Galtung um, identified or described what he called three different forms of violence. Direct violence, which would be physical violence, structural violence, which is a more kind of institutional form of violence, and cultural violence, which is more kind of ideological. And in his uh, sort of writings, he thinks this as sort of a violence triangle with culture, structural, and direct violence as the three um, sort of points of this triangle. And Galatong argued that cultural violence makes direct and structural violence look and even feel right, or at least not wrong. So he argues that the study of cultural violence highlights the way in which the act of direct violence and the fact of structural violence are legitimized and thus rendered acceptable in society. And his point was really that, you know, we, we think about peace as the absence of violence. But in order for that to make sense, we first have to understand, well, what is violence? So if peace is the absence of violence, then how do we define violence? Is it just one thing? And he argued, no, it's at least three things. So we can also think about how violence serves kind of this broader function in society, particularly when we think about uh, structural and cultural violence. 
So, for example, some of you may be familiar with French philosopher René Girard, who's written a lot about uh, religion and violence. And he refers to this as sort of relationship as the mimetic nature of violence, um, by which he means that um, social competition between uh, different individuals is driven by, he argued at least, desire and rivalry. So I see what someone else has, and I really like that, and then I want to have that, and then that person who has it then becomes a rival. And so I'm trying to outdo them, which can then lead to violent conflicts, which he described as a sort of imitative desire. So I imitate what I believe others desire until it becomes my own. And that conflict over trying to kind of hold on to um, and sort of maintain, you know, the supreme position in a rivalry or to capture that which you most desire often becomes the source of communal violence. And the way that that is often resolved, he argued, is with when a community essentially identifies a scapegoat or the scapegoat mechanism as he called it um, that they can sort of direct their anger and violence onto um, in order to kind of restore social cohesion in that society so we can think about the tutsis and violence against them from the hutus in rwanda we can think about the jews in germany um, and many other different examples that kind of play out this scapegoating role in society now, in discussing the links between religion and violence, um, Schleicher and co-authors describe six different roles that they view religion playing in any given conflict. So the first one is religion as a community. So this, we might think about the authority, religious authorities, our religious relationships, and our religious identities. Um, the second one is religion as a set of teachings. So the concepts and norms and values that we get from religious traditions. Um, a third is religion as sort of spirituality, so that personal experience um, and why religious you know, beliefs motivate us and give meaning both to ourselves and to the world around us. Another way is thinking about religion as a practice, so the very kind of everyday symbols and rituals and myths that we do um, as part of our religious traditions. We can also think about, they argue, religion as a discourse, so the way that um, language and power and worldviews, or what the Germans call Weltanschauung, are kind of embedded in how we think about and see the world. When we talk about you know, sin and good and evil, that's kind of a, a religious language. And then finally, religion as an institution. So the leaders and the networks and the delivery of various services from soup kitchens um, to uh, community services that various religious leaders and institutions play. So all these are kind of different roles that we can think about religion playing in any given conflict and perhaps also in any given peace scenario. So in, in each of these six examples, we can find ways in which religion can both uh, fuel the flames of a social conflict, but also put water on those flames to help put out communal violence. So for our interest really, or as, as scholars more broadly religious studies, um, what we want to understand and try to pay attention to are these different kind of complex and interconnected dynamics of religion in various conflicts so that we can think about, you know, that relationship between religion and violence. Where do they intersect? How are they operating? Are they in tension? Are they working in collaboration? Um, in which case are they one? In which case are they other? And how do we try to explain that better? So in our article on religious nationalism in a global world from Jürgensmeyer, our final one, uh, we get a bit of a re-sort of framing of some of the earlier arguments from Jürgens Meyer in that piece that we read for this week. And he really argues that if we think about contemporary context, the vote in the UK for Brexit and the election of Trump in the United States in 2016, uh, the rise of figures like Viktor Orban um, in Hungary, all of these are, he argues, indications of a strident new form of nationalism that's sweeping the world. And he argues that much of it is interwoven with religion, which is creating an aggressive cultural nationalism that's asserting itself from uh, Myanmar to the Middle East, to the United States, and beyond. And really, at the heart of the argument that Jürgen Meyer is making is this claim that resurgent forms of religious nationalism are tied to globalization and these various changing political, cultural, and, econolog and uh, economic dynamics, also ecological, actually, at the global level. The paradox here, as Jürgens Meyer points out, is that while religions are increasingly global in scope, they're also reinforcing these kind of 
local ties and expressions of nationalism that are often hot, you know, hostile to these very global trends. So what we're seeing there is that um, this weakening of older forms of secular nationalism is one of the outcomes of this rising kind of new global religious nationalism. And among other things, as Jürgens Meyer notes, global forces are undermining many of the traditional pillars on which the secular nation state has been based, uh, such as national sovereignty, economic autonomy, and social identity. So as we you know, have been talking about, religious studies scholars in the 80s and 90s um, really thought that the rise of these kind of new forms of religious and ethnic nationalism were tied up with these anti-colonial struggles and this kind of broader rejection of westernization and kind of western models of uh, development and economics and politics. Um, but by the 2000s, what we were really seeing was a rise of new forms of ethno-religious nationalism not just as a kind of rejection of modernity and this kind of Western-led project, um, but in some ways as a response to post-modernity and to kind of new transnational forms, uh, most clearly globalization. So in some ways, the kind of fading or the declining power of the nation state and these older forms of secular nationalism have produced both opportunities for new nationalisms to emerge and also the need for them um, to fill in the vacuum left behind. So as he argues, the opportunity has arisen, you know, both as these older sort of secular orders seemed weak, um, but also because there was a need for a national identity to kind of persist so we would know who we are and what our values were, um, both in public life and in kind of broader political engagements. And the increasing absence of any other kind of ways to identify our national loyalties and our commitments, these older ideas of religion and ethnicity and traditional culture um, have become resources for national identification. And it's precisely the kind of the resurgence and the kind of restating of these old kind of traditional values that are at the heart of kind of this tension between religious and secular uh, forms of nationalism. So for us as scholars, particularly in religious studies, we want to try to make sense of these diverse ways that both religious nationalism and secular nationalism are changing, and more importantly, how they're responding to this breakdown of these older forms of social organization. And what does that mean in the context of you know, decreasing support for secular nationalism around the world? So Jürgens Meyer suggests in part to sort of answer that question, that the turn to these older, more kind of traditional values and ideas in kind of our times today um, is in a sense is very radical in part because these calls are sort of, you know, reaching back into the past to restore these sort of pre-secular ideas and values. And in that process, uh, Jürgens Meyer and others have argued, um, <clears throat> what we're seeing is that these religious movements, particularly these religious nationalist movements, are becoming more conf confrontational and often violent. And this is precisely because, as he notes, they reject the intervention of outsiders and their ideologies and at the risk of being intolerant, they pander to their indigenous cultural bases and enforce traditional social boundaries. So we might think about here in the United States, you know, this emphasis on a kind of white uh, Protestant history and culture that is really at the core of what it means to talk about, for example, American or U.S. history. But in the global context, this can translate into uh, strongly anti-Western ethnic and religious nationalisms, uh, particularly in countries that were formerly colonized or, you know, had major imperial interventions from the U.S. and Europe. But on the flip side of that, in countries like the U.S. and in Europe, um, in Canada, Australia, what this has actually often meant is not a rejection of anti-Western uh, forms of politics, but rather a backlash against um, immigrants and perceived religious and cultural threats, so uh, anti-Islamic or um, anti-Jewish sentiments in much of uh, U.S. and Europe. But as Jürgens Meyer notes, uh, for example, many of the supporters who voted for Brexit in the U.K. context or for Trump in the U.S. Uh, presidential context thought they were rejecting international trade alliances, so kind of globalist alliances, and the influx of refugees from around the world. They imagine that their nations can return to a self-sufficient economic <clears throat> and political order that does not rely on global networks and transnational associations. 
So there's a sense that somehow, you know, we can push the foreigners away. We can kind of save or reclaim what is authentically our culture, you know, whether you're Britain, uh, a Brit or an American or uh, whatever country you might be in. So, you know, we saw this with uh, you know, build the wall uh, kind of chance and calls to deport um, undocumented individuals. We've seen this in the case of um, England with, you know, rallying by the National Front and other parties against what they see as the Islamization of um, Europe. Um, we see this with um, nationalist movements in places like Russia and the resurgence of both a Russian, almost like going back to the kind of the Russian Empire, some of the flags there are not even kind of the modern Russia, but they go back to the Imperial Russia, um, as well as rallies in Germany and other places that are kind of on the forefront um, of some of these European immigration um, debates and migrations as well. So this kind of surgence of uh, a nationalism, often a religious nationalism, that sees these um, sort of outside influences in communities as some kind of a threat to their culture and their identities. So when these uh, kind of examples emerge, these ethnic and religious expressions of nationalism can be either isolationist, so this is kind of the America first uh, version, as we saw, or they can be transnational. You look at cases like India or Indonesia and a few other countries where um, the nationalists also kind of have alliances overseas. So in some cases, maybe the idea is to create local religious states that could then merge into some larger transnational body. And this is part of what we see with um, ISIS and Al-Qaeda and others, this idea of uh, reviving the Islamic Caliphate across um, you know, the Middle East, eventually much uh, greater area. But other times it might be on creating and expanding um, religious and ethnic um, diasporas. So we think about maybe the Sikh community in the U.S. or Canada um, being leveraged by um, Sikhs in um, parts of India, say Hindustan, um, to try to argue for you know, independent states. So you see both kind of a very narrow nationalism from some of these groups, but also sometimes more of a transnational, but still the focus ultimately is back on the state. And these kind of expressions can emerge in response to local calls for an ethnic or religious state. We saw this, for example, in 79 with the Iranian Revolution and the creation of the Islamic State. Um, but they can also appear when existing secular states collapse or become um, destabilized. So Al-Qaeda in Afghanistan, or ISIS, or ISIL in Syria and northern Iraq. So similar ideas, but they may kind of come about through different processes. So Jurgens Meyer notes that you know, in this new world order that many of these religious and ethnic nationalists oppose, you know, they don't like this idea of a new world order. And um, they note that the increasingly multicultural societies of many urban communities all over the world have undermined, in their minds, traditional cultures and their leaders. So they've imagined the United States and the UN to be agents of an international conspiracy, one that they think is hell-bent on forming a homogenous world society and a global police state. So this is very much the kind of fear of the new world order. Um, those of you that may be familiar with Alex Jones, this kind of idea of a global police state um, is very common. QAnon, again, would fit into this category as well. So we, you know, and we see this in many different contexts, not just even in religious um, societies. So, you know, we're seeing a resurgent, um, not necessarily a secular nationalism, but kind of a quasi-secular nationalism in China, particularly in related to Hong Kong in uh, recent months. You see this, for example, in France with Marie Le Pen and others, where there's kind of a reassertion of French uh, nationality and identity, which is clearly um, not North African, is not Muslim. Um, it, as the, you can see from the poster on the top right there, no to Brussels, yes to France, with um, Joan of Arc kind of at the backdrop there, invoking this kind of iconic image of French religious resistance against in that case, uh, you know, Islamic uh, invaders. You've got groups like the National Front in uh, UK and England who are, again, calling for sort of saving not only England, but also kind of white people and the white future, what they see is under threat. And, and again, examples here from the United States with this message about um, how the U.S. is um, uniquely and uh, most importantly uh, essentially a Christian nation. So all these are different forms of expression of these uh, emerging religious nationalisms, and in some cases, uh, sort of variants of secular nationalism, 
Um, China being kind of a strange outlier here because their power is growing on the global scale. And although you have Taoism and Confucianism um, and other religions in China, ostensibly as a communist nation, China is kind of a secular power. Now, Jürgens Meyer refers to these kind of examples as guerrilla anti-globalism. And he really sees this as a, dynam a dynamic which runs the gamut from you know, radical Islamists on one side to alt-right and white supremacist groups, for example, or Proud Boys on the other. And it, but it kind of brings them together by their kind of militant um, politics and their sort of opposition to um, globalization and these kind of global dynamics. So as Jürgens Meyer suggests, these different possible futures each contain a paradoxical relationship between the national and global aspects of these ethno-religious politics. And this suggests, he argues, that there's a semiotic relationship between certain forms of globalization and religious and ethnic nationalism. It may appear ironic, but the globalism of culture and the emergence of transnational political and economic institutions actually enhance the need for local identities so we can distinguish ourselves kind of from that global other out there. And they also create the desire for more localized forms of authority and social accountability. So, and it's precisely these tensions um, that we see playing out today in the world and that we want to think more about um, next week as we continue to kind of wrestle with how do we think about the increasing importance um, and relationships of global issues um, and world religions. Okay, so just a couple of reminders for week one for class assignments. Um, you have your introductory class video, uh, just a couple of minutes kind of saying hi, introducing yourself, responding to those questions in the discussion forum. It's due Monday, June 28th, so our first day um, by the end of uh, the day there. Our discussion post number one is due Wednesday, June 30th, by the end of the day. Again, also there in that discussion forum, and that uh, will be responding to the question posted there. And then you have your first two peer response posts due um, by Friday, July 2nd, at the end of the day. And those will be two posts to your peers um, in response to their Wednesday post. And just as a reminder there, um, when you look at the class schedule on Blackboard, um, there's the Pew Center Religious Typology Quiz that I've asked everyone to do. Um, you want to do that first before you do the discussion um, post number one on Wednesday because that post is asking you to respond to um, the results of that survey. So, okay, that's it for our week one lecture, and I look forward to hearing your thoughts and comments to um, all these materials. Okay, bye everybody.